again. Boy, I wish I could bring, wish I could bring people up on my slide, my slide here. All I have is a list of participants. But okay, anyway, um, my name is Ben Usach. If I haven't met everybody, uh, I'm formerly from the area. Uh, three years ago or four years ago now, I was taking a ski lift ride, and some dude offered me a job in Colorado. I couldn't even consider uh, still working with Mike, so I had accepted the job. And um, now I'm out in Colorado running an ER out here, uh, doing a little bit of EMS, mostly actually ski patrol from a pre-hospital point of view. But I got a couple gigs going on. I'm working with an AMR out here and also, uh, which is really satisfying, the Buckley Air Force Base has this massive EMS organization, which has been just uh, awesome to work with. So let me tell you a little bit about the rules of what I'm giving a presentation. And that is simply there are none. I sort of hope, as long as it's kind of quiet in the background, everybody's uh, has their mute off, not on, but off. Because I'm going to ask some questions, sort of hoping this can be sort of interactive. And I'd like people to kind of shout out with what they think. And if, you, if I don't clarify something and I make it more confusing, I want you to jump on me for it. Because if you're thinking about it, I'm sure somebody else is as well. So with that, this talk is, is about pediatric patients. And sort of my start to this is the fact that I usually forget my anniversary. I would forget my wife's birthday, except it's the same date as mine. But I probably can tell you to the last, every sick kid that I've ever had to care for. And it's not that I haven't seen a lot of them, because I think I have. It's just that taking care of kids is just different. It leaves a very strong emotional mark on us that it's really hard to break from. And I never really felt the need to decompress from any case, except for those where the kids don't make it because it has such a deep impact. Uh, causes the highest anxiety, causes the greatest stress. And really, my, in my mind, the only way to deal with that, quite frankly, is to have enough knowledge and preparation so that when you do see the kids, you at least have some tools or a couple of arrows in your quiver to be, a, mom too loud to have a couple of arrows in your quiver to be able to deal with them. And that's the purpose of this lecture. Just one other thought, um, greetings from Colorado, Pidgey. Okay, let's move forward. <laughs> All right, so what I'm gonna talk about is nothing new, nothing that I can lay, really lay credit for, but there's some awesome tools out there that are so important to us in the ER, but even more significantly, I would argue important to you in the street. There's a lot of experience in the room. I recognize a lot of old friends and old names. And the simple truth is that you guys, just like us, were on that first impression. So I'm going to introduce or discuss with you the PAT or the patient assessment triangle, pediatric assessment triangle, and offer some tips using the PAT to help manage some of these patients and help us form our impressions and basically come to that one simple question. When you walk into the house, wade through all the crap at the door, kick the dog that's trying to bite you, is that kid sick or not sick? That's the whole purpose of this talk today in my mind. So this pediatric assessment triangle was formed by the PD, a combination, a collaborative between the ER docs, pediatric ER docs, and the pediatricians. It basically is just that. You walk into the door, you look at the patient, and you apply them to this triangle. And you ask these questions. How do they look? How are they breathing? What is our general impression of the circulation? And by just answering these three questions, we're going to do what we can to say, hey, this is a sick patient going to need it need immediate intervention, may need a quick load and go versus, you know what, this kid's okay. We really don't need to do too much about it. Uh, we can probably take our time, work our way through this case and everything's gonna be fine and stable. All right, so let's start with the appearance. This is pretty easy, right? We've all seen this with our own kids and certainly with our patients. What is tone? Somebody tell me what tone is. What is pediatric tone? How well they're moving their limbs. Like, are they floppy? Are they controlled? Yeah, that's it. You just gave me two extremes. Are they floppy? Are they are they controlling their limbs? We've all seen floppy babies, right? Holding the kid like this in one hand, like it's a mannequin versus the kid that's just got good tone. And obviously I'm not talking about seizures, just good muscle tone. Interactive is to us, 
to the parents and to the environment. It is absolutely appropriate for these young kids and the toddlers to be fearful of this hospital environment, to be fearful of you coming in, this stranger kind of um, lurking over them, getting ready to do your assessment. You would expect them to be understandably hesitant and concerned. And that concern look is actually a good sign. Are they consolable? Consolable in their mother's arms, father's arms. Are they calm? Are they are they crying um, with tremendous irritability, or or are the child able to stay relaxed enough so that you are able to do what you need to do? Do they lock eyes with you with look or gaze? Do they lock eyes on the parents? We've all seen sick, ill kids, and one of the hallmarks of this is they have a very weak speech, a very weak cry. We want to hear a vigorous cry. Consolable, but a vigorous cry are all signs that we have a kid that's going to be a little less sick. Um, this work of breathing, just let's table this for a second. As we get further into this talk, I've got some pretty good slides to talk about what we're dealing with with breathing. But almost, I would argue, more than adults, it is the positioning of the child that helps us figure out how much distress they're in. Now, somebody tell me what this reminds them of, this positioning. Keep it clean. What do you guys say? Tripod. Tripod. The kid is telling you, I need an airway, right? This is the positioning that we would have if a person was on the, where the tragus meets the sternum when we're getting ready to put a breathing tube in, right? They're trying to line up all their airways to assist them with maximum ventilation maximum oxygenation by lining up those airways. That's why the child is tripoding, to be able to maximize the air they're able to bring in. This is what retractions look like. I got a question. Can you guys hear the um, audio with the slide? Mike? A little bit. Uh, all right, let me turn up the volume. Is that any better? Not really. Mm -hmm. Okay, super, that's gonna kill my work of breathing slides. All right, but anyway, these are retractions. Well, we all understand what, what, what breathing is, the physiology of breathing. That the diaphragm goes down, that the chest wall expands. With retractions and with intercostal retractions, what we're seeing is the child recruiting additional muscles of respiration to help them gasp in that air. This is a sign of a sick kid possibly heading for a respiratory arrest. Nasal flaring is the same principle. This slide is a combination of nasal flaring and the retractions. Kind of surprised this kid is in, not in the hospital, honestly, looking at him. But with those retractions, it's a kipnea breathing fast, and that flaring, he or she is maximizing the air that they're able to get into the air. Head bobbing is the same principle. By head bobbing, what the child is able to do is to take that airway from a neutral position and again, put it up into a position that they're in a sniffing and able to bring in whatever air that they can. Um, our largest organ when we're considering the circulation to the skin is the skin. And what we're looking here is actually uh, modeling, not cutis marmorata. What's cutis marmorata? Any moms out there know this? So when a kid gets in cold, because their mechanisms for adopting the cold are just a little bit different than ours, they get kind of a marbling of the skin. Don't confuse this with cyanosis. And one of the first early signs that you're going to see in kids is you may very well see around puri or oral um, cyanosis or around the lips tells you that this is somebody who's not receiving enough oxygen. It could be hypoxic or just in a shock state and not getting enough oxygenated blood. So let's move on to a couple cases and try to explore some of the ways to use this triangle. And some cases are very real, real, real world with what you're going to deal with. All right, here we go. One-year-old boy presents with complaint of cough, difficulty breathing, past histories of A low grade fever and this weird seal like cough.
Let's put the kid on the triangle. What's the diagnosis first? Group. 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 Very good. Excellent. Um, so this kid's alert, smiling, non-toxic. Circulation is good. They're pink, but they have audible inspiratory strider. And hopefully, if these slides work out, we'll be able to talk more about strider. But audible inspiratory strider at rest. And that is what you see with croup. And when you kind of put this all together, what you do with this pediatric assessment triangle is you form general impressions. And I'm gonna offer you a number of options or categories that we can put these kids into when we use this triangle. Well, what are the conclusions we can draw from the pediatric assessment triangle? The stable kid, the respiratory distress kid. That's respiratory distress. They're gonna have a normal appearance. Normal. Go ahead. Question? Normal appearance, normal circulation, but we're going to see issues with work of breathing. When you start to see respiratory failure, then we're starting to disturb other arms of the triangle. They're going to start to look really bad. Obviously, they've got work of breathing, but now you're going to start to see this um, at the circulation level, uh, circulation level as well. That is, they're starting to hypoperfuse. They're getting hypoxic. You're going to see some end stage results of that in your evaluation of the child. And I put dynamic because I think we've, well, any of us who have taken care of really sick kids can appreciate, these kids just, they fall over the cliff. The kid can be looking kind of crappy and then they look really bad. They fall off of the edge of that cliff. Respiratory failure rapidly can fall into respiratory arrest. And I would argue it happens much quicker with kids than it does with adults because you're just lacking that reserve, which the adults have. Shock, same general rules. Work of breathing looks bad. Appearance looks bad. Circulation looks bad. And that's even more dynamic. It is a very thin line. <laughs> the shock state and falling into uh, severe, uh, falling into cardiac arrest or just losing vital signs. Again, no reserves. Kids fall off the cliff very, very quickly. Central nervous system dysfunction, on the other hand, is a little bit more altered you're gonna see possibly a normal work of breathing. You very well may see normal circulation, but they're just not going to look right. That means you just gotta look back and kind of change your scope of vision and start looking for a problem in the CNS. And then finally, we understand that when the kid's in a cardio, cardiopulmonary arrest, all the wheels are off the bus, right? They look crappy, they're not breathing, there is no circulation. And that's just a kid that's completely tanked. All the arms are a severe dysfunction. <laughs> Nobody hopefully going to miss this. Okay, where are we going to put our croup kid? Here. Second. Stable, respiratory distress, respiratory failure. I don't think anyone's putting them in shock or dysfunction. Respiratory distress. Respiratory distress. Yeah, I'll go with that. Respiratory distress, absolutely. This kid um, otherwise looks good. You certainly are picking up some respiratory signs, but he falls in the realm of respiratory distress. Um, what do we do with them? Well, we, there's an upper airway obstruction here. That's what croup is. We leave them in a position of comfort. The biggest guy on the bus doesn't need to put their knee on the kid's chest to keep them flat on the stretcher. Not necessary. Figure out what the O2 sat is, understanding their limitations to that, particularly during the winter. Provide oxygen as needed. Uh, begin specific therapy. What do we got for this? What do we have for Strider on the bus? Racemic epi. Racemic epi. Um, do you guys have a mix now? Wait, what? Uh, you have premix or do you have to make uh, your own? Premix. Premix. Pre wow. Whalen brings in big budget. I had no such luck as that when I was medical director. But still, yeah, premix is great. Racemic epi, awesome for this patient. The only codicil for this is if you're treating at the house and you've got a prolonged extrication for whatever reason, and mom goes, oh man, this kid looks great. I say, just leave him home. You did a great job. Thank you so much, paramedic. I do not recommend that because racemic epi kind of, in my mind, means you need to have a little observation time, right? Um, I don't know, Joe, if you're still on the line, but Mike, how long do you watch these kids in the ER? Mike or Joe? 
at least two hours, probably four. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say the same, two to four hours. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. So don't let them talk you out of taking this kid to the hospital, unless you feel like hanging out for four hours. Um, we need eyes on them for a period, just in case they get an epi rebound and actually could end up a little bit worse than they initially started. So it's our responsibility to transport these kids under any and all circumstances. All right, and basically this is what croup looks like. Uh, we get this thing on x-ray, we call a steeplechase sign. So it's not hard to imagine, you're trying to get air through this puppy and it's tight. That's why you get those striderous sounds that are associated with it. The flip side to that is the more experienced moms may know, take the kid out, take the kid into a steamy shower, take the kid out into the cold air, because both of these things very well could provide dilatation to this trachea and sort of open it up. I'm just giving a bandage to that. What do you guys think? Um, Joe, Mike, any additions to that? This is a Whalen's kid, but any additions to that? <laughs> this is good parenting. Yeah. Okay. Ian is a baby, Whalen's kid now. It's all good. <laughs> Joe, Mike, any group additions? No, I think that's that covers it. Okay. All right. Next case. Severe difficulty breathing. Three-month-old girl presents with severe dyspnea. Seen in the ED two days earlier. This is where you go up to... Uh, uh, one of the docs would go, hey, remember this kid you saw, our favorite line. Seen an ED two days earlier, sent home with a diagnosis of bronchiolitis. Sent him home with inhalers. Everything looks great. Her dyspnea has increased over the last 24 hours. Go up to kid's room where the parents lead you. We look at this kid. Lethargic, glassy stare, poor muscle tone, very floppy. Marked sternal and intercostal retractions. We saw that rapid and shallow respirations. And in my mind, the most telling problem here, pale with circumoral cyanosis. Sick or not sick? Very, Very sick. Sick, sick. And how does that help us? Well, for sure we know we gotta get on the, get, uh, on the go here. What's the diagnosis? Respiratory failure. Respiratory, Respiratory failure. failure, spot on, man. This kid is beyond distress. We're heading for shock due to respiratory failure. So I'm going to go with you there, 100% accurate. So what do you do about this? Well, this is a little controversial. So I just got to toss it out there and away we go. Always important, particularly with kids, you always reassess after each intervention and always take a look to see if you're making things better or worse. Because they're getting worse doesn't mean you did something wrong, but certainly your intervention could make them worse. So you always want to be conscious of this. Most of this data came out of California. They are not big fans of paramedic intubation of pediatrics for two basic facts. Well, three actually. Number one, high risk, low number procedure. We just don't do a lot of them, much like ER docs. Um, number two is the fact that most of these kids you're able to bag into the hospital and here was the kind of the critical breaking point out of this rather formidable California study is it did not, paramedic intubation, these kids did not reduce morbidity or mortality, mortality or death of these kids at all. Same numbers across the board. Well, what does that tell you? Well, it says a couple things. First of all, they're not used to Delaware County babies. That's fair, <laughs> right? So different population. They don't know what we do. They don't know your skill set. Um, I would never think or dream or would I ever have tried to take this skill away from the, the paramedic. However, I don't have an issue on the flip side to the medic that decides to use a pediatric eye gel or another superglottic airway or bags the patient in. I think that is absolutely appropriate. Um, everyone's going to make fun of them when you get back to the station, but you just have to tough it out. Um, these patients, if they can't be intubated in the emergency room, the truth is, again, you may take a rash of crap for it, but you've got anesthesia and a NICU attending or NICU somebody upstairs to come down and back you up, uh, something we just don't have in the field. So as a result, you're not really wrong if you opt to do less aggressive airway management as long as you are able to ventilate the patient. That's where it stops and starts. If you can ventilate them, any way you do it, any ship in the storm is absolutely okay. 
Um, vascular access, no question. Uh, and a kid this sick, I'm going to go to an IO and just reassess the kid continually because they absolutely get worse. Next kid, case vomiting. 15 month old boy, 20, Mike, as the medical director, do you have any thoughts about pediatric intubation in the field? I'm a big fan of BVM. I mean, I've only intubated five kids in the past 10, eight years since. So it's a, it's a hard skill. It can always get good BVM seal. And at the hospitals, we all have backup, which is just uh, very helpful and, and sometimes needed in these kids. Again, if, you're, if your comfort level is that high, which mine isn't, I would BVM until you get to the hospital. But everyone knows their own skill. I mean, Joe? Yeah, I think if it's respiratory failure, bagging is the answer. Obviously, there's situations if it's something else, obstruction or trauma or other situations where I think intubation may be better. I, I think I would, um, bagging is never wrong, but there may be situations where uh, I would say uh, if, it's, if it's more than just simple respiratory failure, then intubation makes sense in the field. I'm really liking the pediatric IGLs. Uh, the interesting thing is they are not approved by the FDA, though manufactured but uh, they've been getting a lot of popularity and uh, just something to think about, but I gotta go, I gotta go with, uh, go with the uh, other docs in this. I believe in bagging these patients when they can. Uh, if the kid tolerates uh, an eye gel, I might give it a shot. Um, I like eye gels because they've got a terribly steep learning curve. You deploy one and you've deployed a hundred, but uh, yeah, if you can get away with bagging, you're having a good day. And then we do uh, carry we do carry King 2 and 2.5, but I don't know how many people have actually used them. That's a great point. Um, they've fallen terribly out of favor for a number of reasons. Has anybody online ever used a pediatric King? I'd love to hear the story. I have not. No. Interesting. One, one, one more point on that. If you have a kid in respiratory failure, you can't bag. You better take a look with the laryngoscope because there's going to be something in the airway which you need to remove. That's happened twice in my career. You just you can't bag them. Something's not right. Something's not in your head. Nothing wrong with taking the laryngoscope, taking a look down and pulling out that balloon, that hot dog or whatever could be in there with the McGills. Or we do have the pediatric blade for the air track as well. The, uh, you could also reposition the airway. Sometimes that just clears it. Yeah. Um, but that's an awesome point. We all, uh, any of us that are parents know, uh, kids are terribly prone to obstructive airways. Uh, Joe actually has a really good story about that, um, which I'm going to suck him into in just a few minutes. Uh, so next case, 15-month-old boy, 24-hour history of vomiting, diarrhea. Diarrhea is water with blood and pus. Oh, that's not good. Attempts to roll rehydration by mom were unsuccessful. They called 911 when the child became listless and started to refuse the feedings. Now we put the kid on the triangle walk into the door, listless, responds poorly to the environment. Now, effortless tachypnea, no retractions. Effortless tachypnea, no retractions. Pale face and trunk, modeled extremities, sick or not sick? sick. Okay, why effortless tachypnea? Sick. Why effortless to keep? Why is this? He has, no, he has no muscle tone to support it, I assume. Not compensating. Sorry? He's not using any accessory muscles. No, nope. effortless to keep. He's breathing uber fast. Why? What's he doing? As Blowing off CO2. Balance. Blowing off CO2. Okay, we're on the right track. Sounds, rhymes with. Acidosis. Acidosis. Yeah, metabolic acidosis, right? This kid is breathing, exactly right. This kid is breathing down, he's in metabolic acidosis because of this tremendous GI illness. Excellent. Breathing it down. That's why it is effortless tachypnea without retractions. He's having a physiologic response to being profoundly acidotic. Good. Where are we going to put this kid? Shock. You bet. This kid's in shock. No doubt about it. Um, everything's abnormal on the triangle. Abnormal appearance, abnormal breathing, abnormal circulation. So get this kid, he's in shock. Management considerations, 
It's effortless to kidney. We're going to support. We're going to hyperoxygenate them. I don't really care about 94% in this case. We're going to give them 100% O2, quick vascular <clears throat> access, um, and we're going to administer volume expanding crystalloid in what increment? 10 ml. 20 per kilo. 20 cc per kilo. Okay, I've heard 10, 20 feedback. What do you say? What's the number? Uh, 20 milliliters per kilogram. 20 cc per kilo, spot on, good. Hey, can I give these guys like a week off for a good answer? Does that work? <laughs> we, uh, we don't have enough staff then, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> hey, I'll come back. I, can, I, can, I got skills. I don't drive very well, but- Bring your, I'll, I'll bring your Skittles, we'll drive. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so what we discovered, and uh, you know, Joe and Joe and Mike can support this, there's as crazy as shock or shock is, uh, septic shock is the, um, one of the big four in adults, right? We got shock, STEMI trauma, uh, and shock, STEMI trauma, and sepsis. Same thing applies with kids. Septic shock, time is unbelievably critical. We got to get these kids hydrated rapidly, fill up that tank, get in the emergency room, get those antibiotics on board. So, so time critical. And that's the walk away. Um, so, okay, four, five, ben, on that case, okay, if you talk about someone who has that type of shock, obviously caused by dehydration, um, I want to try and minimize the size of the volume. I want to go with a push dose epi. And we talk about the new crashing patient protocol. Mike, how would this fit in with that, with the new changes on the push dose epi? So I think it'd be, uh, I have to look at the pediatric dosing because it's still just, and there's no push dose epi in kids. Yeah. Uh, so it push is dose epi okay. is just for adults. Fluid. So it's just fluid. So okay. Ian, since you're taking me down this road, share with us what the deal is with septic shock and why this fluid is so important. Or just set you pawn it off on somebody, phone a friend. Why is uh, it uh, Carissa right now is dying. Okay, Carissa, <laughs> bring it on. Why is this so important? Why is this fluid such the, the consideration? What's happening in septic shock? No perfusion. But why? What's going on? What's happening with the tank? I don't, I don't know you said, but I know you're going to distributed shock. You need to have, get more volume. So in the distant background, I heard distributive shock. So that's right. So more volume, why? You're spot I mean, on. Uh, um, maybe it's already fluid depleted. So you have to replace the... Uh, like right now you're doing fluid replacement. So certainly this kid's hypovolemic because I presented him with diarrhea. But the thing to remember in septic shock is that because of the effects of your body and the bacteria themselves, it wildly dilates blood vessels. Now, what this means in the real world is if you take that shot glass of, off of Ian's desk, now you're taking that shot glass of water and you pour it into a liter jug. That's an exaggeration. But the point is the vessel has become that much larger. Mm -hmm. So because of that, we want to tank up that vessel. Then we squeeze down on those blood vessels with the pressors when you get them to us in the emergency room. Yes, this is a crashing patient, but push dose epi isn't really where we go with these kids. Mm -hmm. But we want to get the pressor on after we get them adequately fluid, fluid rehydrated. And honestly, if I had my druthers, and I have no problem with this. And if, if you can't get the order from Riddle, feel free to have, call my cell phone if you still need it. I just blame me, even though I won't be responsible. But if you're stuck in a snowstorm and you're taking this kid to the hospital and your first 20 cc's per kilo is gone, and they still look like shit, you hit them again with an additional 20 without ever looking twice. Absolutely. Uh, agreed, docs? Yeah, and you go up to 60 free hospital, I think is what the protocol says. I would not hesitate. My, my second Absolutely. one will probably be 30 cc's per kilo because you got to fill up that tank. The tank is empty. In addition, this kid's got hypovolemic, um, hypovolemic issues as well. Yeah, very good. Exactly, spot on. All right, next case. Six-month-old girl brought to the ED by my mother after falling from the bed onto a carpeted floor. Mother states infant is sleepy was worried there were no improvement, there was no improvement in mental status after three hours of observation. Parenting 101. 
Now we put this kid on the triangle, right? Obviously this kid looks sick, but you're breathing normal. Circulation is normal, but now they're lethargic and poorly responsive to the environment. Floppy baby, abnormal appearance in the face of normal breathing, normal circulation. Where's this kid go? Central nervous. Okay. Bang, central nervous system dysfunction, spot on. What are the management priorities? What do you want to do with this kid? And oh, by the way, your medical command radio is broken. Your cell phone's dead. Uh, your um, your Brazil tape is missing. Everything's wrong. Oh, and you're in a blizzard. I have your cell phone number. I'll call you. Yeah, but your cell phone's dead. We've already. Phone a friend. A bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no phone a friend on this one. What's your priorities? Immobilization, uh, airway management. Yeah, yeah. If you're having airway issues. So I would argue our deal here is provide oxygen, closely monitor the, violate, the ventilations, but you must, must, must get a glucose on this kid because you very well could, they, if they're not at the point of being tachypnic, you have to be very concerned about hypoglycemia in this kid. Just saying, Mike, if I were doing skills review on this, I'd make this kid seize just to really, remember those days, guys? Just yeah. make that kid seize. That was remember those days fondly. Okay. Questions many years ago. <laughs> so what's so special about the pediatric assessment? What makes it different? Well, it's very hands-on, right? The other thing is kids in the kids just don't lie. There is no secondary gain. Nobody's trying to get narcotics. Nobody is trying to get out of work. Um, that's my favorite pediatric difference. What you see is what you get. On the flip side, a lot of times it's veterinary medicine. You got to form your own differentials, come up with your own conclusions, because they're just not giving you what you need to get to the um, get to where you got to go with this patient. So when addressing the airway, uh, always you have to be very careful um, about the airway as far as a head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust. Uh, the kid, by nature of their anatomy, I don't know if you can see my arrow, has a very bloppy um, epiglottis, often larger tongue to um, oral cavity diameter. So often you need to displace that tongue to open up the airway. Suction just in itself based on, um, based on uh, foreign substance in the airway, excess secretions very much can result in dramatic improvement in the infants. Age specific obstructed airway support, great, um, greater than one year, we do abdominal thrust, but still under one year we do back blow and chest thrust to clear, clear out that obstruction. And of course, the advanced airway techniques are very different. We are starting to use cuff tubes across all comers, but at least in my experience, I have more success on the few intubations I've had to do using a straight blade and be very conscious of that floppy epiglottis trying to work it through. And I gotta tell you, we don't use it much, but I spent the money in the ER to make sure we had top notch videoscopic pediatric airway equipment because you're not doing a lot of these. You need your best tools available as well as smaller bougies that should be able to pass into that airway without causing too much trauma. There's an app for this, right? You don't really, there's no magic formula unless one of you guys has one, but you need to know that normal for an infant is very different from an adolescent. The ranges from, as you see here, somebody have a formula I'm missing? <laughs> Bless you. Um, infant 30 to 60, toddlers 24 to 40, preschooler 22 to 34, up to the normal 12 to 16 for the adolescent. And in a child, just like in an adult, very slow or very fast respirations can absolutely be, uh, be worrisome. When we listen with the stethoscope, it's best to go in the anterior over the mid axillary line and above the sternal notch. That's where we're gonna get our best transmission of sounds. And what are some of those things we hear? Well, as promised, we've got airway sounds. Strider is what? What is Strider? Definition? Upper, 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 upper airway. airway. I hope you can hear this. Hear. You can hear the air trying to work its way through that obstructed upper airway very different from wheezing, which is tightening in the lower airways.
but note the muscle retractions, note the uh, intercostal uh, retractions, supracostal retractions and the nasal flaring. Grunting is just a child's way of providing CPAP, right? They're providing CPAP without the machine. It's poor oxygenation, you'll find it in pneumonia, drowning, pulmonary contusions. <laughs> Not hard to imagine, this is stenting open the alveoli, much as we do with our CHF patients. And crackles we've all heard is just fluid around those small airways. Good. And then decrease absent breath sounds. This is my fave. This is a bead that's stuck into the uh, lower airway. Joe, I just got to call you on the spot. Tell your story. Yeah. So um, our youngest son, when he was uh, two years old, um, had an episode of grunting, short of breath, fever. We thought he had pneumonia. We couldn't really hear anything listen to his lungs. I brought him in to see the um, inestimable Dr. Usach, who listened to him and said, you moron, he's got pneumonia. Listen right here. And we listened then. And it was like, oh, yeah, he does have crackles there. I didn't even hear those before. What's the matter with me? <laughs> this is why you never take care of your own kids. So we called the pediatrician and we agreed to put him on some antibiotics. And, you know, three weeks later, he was still short of breath. And we did an x ray and he had, you know, uh, air trapping and went in for a bronc. I have a picture just like this, but instead of a, a, a bead, it's an almond that was stuck in his, uh, his right main stem and uh, had to get that removed bronchoscopically. So wow. um, uh, I've never forgiven Dr. Usatch for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, this, this kids do crazy stuff. We had no idea. And, you know, two doctor parents, that's the worst. Yeah, no, um, my daughter last week uh, had a, her gallbladder out after her dad threw a Pepsi at her and told her to stop whining and drinking so much. So it just goes, it just, docs shouldn't take care of their kids and never bring them to your friends. Um, you have to know there are differences in vital signs, right? Just know they're different. And what would scare the crap out of us in an adult at a heart rate of 160 may be top normal when you're talking about an infant. And again, there, as far as I know, there's no magic formula for this. Just know there are pediatric differences and you need to be aware of these differences when you're approaching a pediatric patient. Um, always good with pulse quality. We look for central, central up high in the brachials and the peripheral pulses. You're able to feel palpable differences with those. That could be impending shock because kids, much like adults, but much more obvious, have sort of in ascending symptoms. The reverse thermometer sign where you feel a temperature gradient between the wrist and then as you move up the arm, as their cyanosis and their uh, shock state worsens, you'll feel cooling sort of ascending up the limbs, up into the shoulders, then ultimately into the core. Cap refill is still a useful tool. And finally, a formula you can take home, uh, a blood pressure of 70 plus two times the age in years is at least a very rough guideline and suggests to you uh, suggests you just roughly what you want to see in a normal pediatric blood pressure. Uh, I don't love pediatric tools for, um, for a neurologic exam. This is the pediatric Glasgow coma scale. Honestly, I'm just not comfortable with it. Uh, you, could, you could slap it up in, in my resuscitation bay. I still wouldn't be great at it. I still prefer to use, use AVPU with this. Uh, and certainly if you're working in a pediatric trauma center and you deal with tons of kids, I think it's okay. You're going to need proficiency with this. But for my, my world and, a, and an EMS world, I think you're fine using AVPU. And then proper exposure is always important to evaluate uh, the child. Um, you've got to be uber, uber concerned with body warmth, um, much more in kids and adults. Again, poor reserves, more body surface area greater risk of heat loss, but full exposure always helps you out. And uh, I'll never forget, I worked with the great Al Sacchetti. I know that uh, both Joe and Mike know him, the great Al Sacchetti. And uh, if there's one thing he taught me, I was a nervous medical student. I'd go in and examine the patient. Um, he would ignore everything I said, walk in the room and would strip the patient immediately just from head to toe, just to make sure he was not missing anything when dealing with the kids. 
watch your temperatures. And whenever possible, if you do have to give IV fluids, try to keep them warm. So let's go back to our kid. Gurgling upper airway sounds, that's not good. Irregular respirations. Now the kid is pale, responds to papal stimuli. Pupils are equal, but sluggish to light and showing signs of trauma. The extremity shows patterns of bruising, fingerprints suggesting some forceful shaking or access. Glucose is okay at 86 and oxygen by mask. But with this initial assessment, this irregular respirations, for sure, this kid is heading for um, intubation. And I just use this, I put this in here after all of our discussion about BBM, just to say that I kind of like the Brazile tape, but the Brazile tape never gave consideration for McDonald's America. And our kids are bigger than the kids that Dr. Braslow calculated for. So I don't love it for dosing drugs. But I'll tell you what I do love it for. Uh, length is almost invariable for intubation, both the tube size as well as your blade size. So very reliable in my mind if you are forced to go down the intubation route um, to use your Braslow tape. Just want to get that out of there. Get that in there. Um, RSI is probably going to be best. So it would be better off in the emergency room. Um, we'll work these kids up and we'll work a kid like this up and down. But here's what's important. And again, the take home point from this slide. Hopefully I am not too obtuse and we're going to figure out that this is a case of abuse. Obviously we all know this is where, where this is going. The story sucks. Mother sat on this kid for three hours. There's signs of external trauma, but it is incumbent on you, not only legally, but ethically in society, you got to come into the come into me and say, look, man, I am very concerned about abuse here. So you report it and I'll report it. But if you report it to me, I'm going to be darn sure, even in the minor case, this kid's not going home with that parent, even if they were able to be discharged. And here's a lot of the reasoning for this. Um, this is one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. This is a shaken baby case um, at point one <coughs> to three months later. And the most horrific thing about this is there's certainly some small bleeds in slide A, but look at all the atrophy in slide B from just this repeated abuse. The fact this kid is never going to cure cancer, will never lead a normal life because of all this neur neuronal damage from this abuse. So it is really incumbent on us to protect these children. We are the last bastion of society. Maybe I am softening up in Colorado. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, comments on that case. What do you guys think? Comments from the docs? On the uh, abuse case? Yeah, uh, any questions, anything? comments about it? Clear yeah, it definitely has to be reported to see by us. Yep. Yeah. All right, Some quick resuscitation stuff here. Um, if you're up for it, I know you've had a long, 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 a long night of lectures. If you got to drop off, that's cool. Um, I'll just take you through these uh, just to kind of shake out some of the cobwebs. And for anyone that sat in a command test for me, can just uh, give them flashbacks and PTSD. <laughs> um, so rolling forward, we have a healthy term infant put down for a nap in a crib after feeding at 9 a.m. Child checked at 1030 a.m. found not to, to, found to be very pale and apneic and not arousable. 911 was called mouth to mouth by mother. EMS arrives, bag mouth ventilation started, patient is pulseless, chest compression started. We going to defibrillate this? No. 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 How about intubating them in the field? Well, maybe. But what happens if we are going to intubate in the field? Somebody talk me through choice of tube. Give me a give me a couple ways of figuring out the tube. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, that's okay. And I told you Braslau tape is okay. Braslau tape is good. Anybody remember the formula? H plus 16 divided by four. Rock on. <laughs> Buy that man a cocktail. Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to place an IO in this patient preferentially. And um, this is not, or scalp veins is certainly, this is a cut down on the right. Scalp veins are absolutely fine. But IO is going to be the preferred method in this child. And just to remind you, uh, that we really prefer if you're going to go the proximal tibia. Kids really don't have um, don't have quite the same anatomy. So, and you really have to avoid the growth plate, or you could do some terrible damage. 
So we're going to uh, make sure the leg is stretched out. We're gonna go to the middle of the leg. We're gonna go a finger breadth down and two down or two over to the flat part of the bone because we have to avoid that um, have to avoid that growth plate. Don't want to cause any problems. And my understanding, you guys have now been approved for um, distal femur. Is that correct? I think proximal femur. I mean, uh, distal, femur. distal femur, right? Not proximal. Yeah. Did somebody talk me through the landmarks on that? Honestly, I've never done the procedure. Does I'm not sure. Work? I didn't hear that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we haven't been, that hasn't been approved yet. Yeah. We're still doing okay. general, doing the tibia. For kids. Okay, proximal tibia. Um, humeral is not a great access point because it's such a soft bone for the kids, but proximal tibia, or if you have to, because it's just an inferior site, um, distal tibia. Um, drug protocols, what are we going to do? Happy. Happy. Dose. I know one milligram per kilogram. Awesome. I do, I do point 0.1 mLs per kilogram because I'm lazy in mass. Okay. Um, is anybody not clear that Ian's just being difficult and that's the exact same thing? <laughs> Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. That's Q3 and Q5 minutes. Um, patient is intubated. We talked about this. Um, uh, you really need a waveform with these kids just to make sure you're in the right place. You very well may have very poor perfusion though because this kid um, has been down for a while. Um, we auscultate the chest. We see the two go through the cords. Um, we're going to always check for a pulse. Truth is, this kid has a horrific prognosis. I had a startling um, event happen on my 60th birthday. I took my wife to Mexico, and uh, this kid launched off the ninth floor of the hotel and came down on his head. And uh, it was the weirdest thing. They, I, I, I saw everybody running, but I was into my third mar uh, margarita, so I wasn't much help. Uh, they... They threw a sheet over the kid and um, police came, took the body away, hosed down all the blood and everybody's drinking margs again. Uh, we do things a little different and, and I, I applaud that. What you do with this kid, even though you know fully well that they're not going to survive is going to impact these parents for the rest of their lives. And statistically, they're doomed. Their relationship is doomed. Most of these end up in, in divorce, but let's just take it in a positive note that the fact you, you do an effort to resuscitate this kid, the fact that you have the parents in the room to give them some sense of closure, as long as the situation is not out of control and, and you're able to control them. Um, most of them probably have some innate knowledge that their child's not going to survive, but I would argue some sense of what you say to them, the way you interact with them, showing them that you are giving it your best effort, even though you know it's not gonna make a difference, um, really makes all the difference in the world. Other thoughts or experiences from this? Anybody ever have one of these cases? I know they're uncomfortable. Yeah. We never fail, never fail to have the parents in the room as we're resuscitating a kid. I, and I think that's one of the best policies we have. Mike, Joe, agreed? Yeah, tough case. Absolutely. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to call the scene, bring it to the hospital, and then just another point is just cardiac arrest, close this hospital. Don't don't go to a pediatric hospital because even, even if you, you think that's where it should go. When you're resuscitating that kid, have the have the mother, father hold the hand, hold the hand, hold the foot. I know it makes it harder to work, a small patient, but uh, everything you do, everything you do at this point is not for the patient, but for the parents, and um, it's as important, if not more so. Always consider your H's and T's when you're caring for these patients. Uh, Thirty minutes is the recommended resuscitation time, and always transport these. I know we sometimes we leave pronounced parents, uh, pronounced adults at home, but we always transport these patients to the hospital. Um, next case, I think we'll probably make this our last in the interest of your time. Got a three-year-old boy awake, ill-appearing, leaning forward, tripod position, noisy breathing, drooling, recent immigrant, no primary care, no immunizations. Welcome to Colorado. Why is this important? What do you got to think about? Forget that big honking. Hepatitis. Yeah, you bet, right? 
Um, what's what's the big? Anybody know what the big deal is with the immunizations in these patients? H flu. H flu. Uh, yeah, H flu is the big one. Pertussis. Uh, pertussis. This kid's got epiglottitis. Epiglottitis. RA one ten. Respiratory rate twenty. Blood pressure is okay. Um, febrile, Saturday, 88%. And believe me, this kid is going to be leaning forward to try to get that epiglottis off his airway. He collapses and he rests, apneic, but it's got a pulse present. Rescue breathing should be initiated. You can try to bag him, but you're going through a big hole. And it's mm -hmm. a hypoxia that led to his arrest. That and the sepsis he's living with. Now, consider the following. When you're trying to bag this kid, First of all, the two-man method or two-person method is absolutely uh, mandated. Supine bagging can be challenging because of the epiglottis versus actually bagging the child sitting up. And this is what I'm talking about. So if you think about this, with epiglottis, you got this big floppy epiglottis that could absolutely flop back and obstruct the airway. But the kid is leaning forward because he or she is instinctively taking the pressure off of that airway and keeping that airway about as open as they possibly can. And when they are prone or leaning forward, the epiglottis is flopping forward and you have your best chance of oxygenation. Now, you very well may need to do a surgical airway on this kid. And the truth is, fortunately, we are close enough to hospitals that if you do a needle crike, you may be able to temporize. And it's the same thing, we're trying to go through that cricoid cartilage. And if you can get yourself a 14 through there, uh -huh. kind of a walk away from this talk, is if you can get a 14 through there, you take a 3O tube, separate the tube, take that hub, and that happens to fit beautifully into the tailpiece of that 14, of that, of the adapter of that 14 tube. And you probably will be able to get enough gas exchange to get this patient to the hospital. Flip side to this, if for whatever reason you don't have a 3O tube, you can take a 3cc syringe, put a seven on the tail end of that, and just use that as a junction point between the two. Guys with me? Mm -hmm. Makes it worth the price of admission. 3O tube, just to separate the tube, and you'll probably be able to get just enough gas exchange to get them to the hospital, okay? And Joe kind of went over VTAC, so I'm going to spare you. Question. Fun ride. Comments. Go for okay. it. Just a suggestion. Um, when you're working with a child, there's a lot of emotion, everything. If you're using the Braslow tape or whatever means, if you're if you actually have a weight on the kid, like you got a weight before they crapped out, um, write that weight on the sheet at their feet. That way there's no question, there's no repetitive, like what weight are we using or whatever, because a lot of, of things you're gonna be doing are based on that weight. And that way you know the initial platform that you're working from. That's a, that's a great point, thank you. 